You're listening to an encore presentation of You Bet Your Garden. From the Univest Short Day Studios of Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, it is time for another autumnal episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks, You Bet Your Garden. Yes, the days are getting shorter, the nights are getting longer, and Old Man River just keeps rolling along. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and on today's show, I'll reveal 13 things you should do in the upcoming days and weeks to have a great garden next spring. Plus, your telecommunicated questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and concisely coherent condemnations. So keep your eyes and your ears right here, cats and kittens, because it's all coming up faster than you potting up your peppers right after this. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am, I honestly am your host, Mike McGrath. You can tell that if you're watching on TV. Now, if you know what I look like, then you could tell. Well, anyway, I'm not a puppet, I'm not a marionette, and I'm not a ventriloquist dummy. I am my own dummy. We got a great show for you today. We're going to give you 13 things that you really should do this fall, which is like now, uh, to get your garden ready for next year. Um, we're also going to have an intriguing phone call from a friend of mine. Um, he's going to elaborate on one of the most important things you can do this fall if you have a lawn. But we got to take those fabulous phone calls at 888 888- 492-9444. Bill, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, nice, nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to you, Bill. How you doing? Oh, just great. Yeah, it's a beautiful day here in uh, Chesterfield, New Jersey. All right, what can we do you for? Well, I've been very concerned about the commercial weed killers, and I've been using it to spray my the weeds that's around the fences for my uh, flowers and vegetables, and I also have pavers that need spraying to get rid of the weeds. And, and um, my neighbor happened to mention to me that he heard that you can mix water and Clorox to kill the weeds. And I wasn't quite sure about it, and I thought I would get your opinion if that's a good solution or something else that might be more effective that's natural. Oh, yeah, yeah. Commercial um. I don't understand this obsession with bleach. Um, Many garden writers who should know better still insist that everybody wash their seed starting containers with bleach at the beginning of the season, or you get these horrifying home recipes online. In the home, for instance, white vinegar is great for cleaning surfaces and disinfecting them and not attacking your lungs. So, matter of fact, that brings me to my first suggestion. Okay. Regular strength vinegar that you get in the supermarket is 5% acidity. Now, that's not how it came out of the vat. It came out of the vat at like 15, 20% acidity, and then they added water to it. It says that right on the label. So, you could try vinegar, you know, straight vinegar, don't dilute it and pour it on the weeds. You can also buy horticultural vinegar, which will be anywhere from 8 to 20% acidity, and that gets rid of the weeds. If you're going to spray it, make sure you wear protective glasses because you don't want any of this stuff to get in your eyes. Now, um, driveway, pavers, things like that, you could also use... um, an herbicide, an organic herbicide whose active ingredient is iron. And these are very popular, and they're very good at getting rid of weeds, and they don't harm anything. Um, and in, in certain amounts, iron is good for your soil. Uh, 
All right, Bill? Yeah, I appreciate your help. It's good talking to you. Good talking to you, pal. Take care. At 888-492-9444. Sharon, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. How you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm just ducky. And I think I recognize your voice. You are the spouse of cheerful Charlie Sarah, who handles that the is correct. audio for the, yeah, what do I win? A broken <laughs> bowling ball? A question yeah. for me. A question for me. And Ashar, uh, you moved, right? Uh, you're retired yes. and you moved closer uh, to the station. Yes, yes. Uh, I retired in May after a 23-year-long career, and now we moved into the area of Easton. All right. What do you want from me now, Sharon? Well, uh, seeing I have a lot more time on my hands and we're in a new area, Poor I've been Charlie. concentrating on the outside of my yard. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I would, I'm delving into something that I've never even thought of planting before. Um, I'd like to talk blueberries with you, Mike. Oh, excellent. Good topic. I heard so many like stories about blueberries in the, in the past. Um, uh, it just seemed like they would be more time consuming and, and the end result, disastrous. And, you know, but this time I decided I have some time on my hands. I like to tackle it and try to make it successful. In as much as I'm not going to go out there and pick blueberries for breakfast, but I mean, at least have a tree that's thriving for the wildlife. And, uh, but I heard you have to temper the soil, something with acid, and the pH. And that's when I kind of, <laughs> I kind of lose it. Well, if you take acid and try to grow blueberries, it may turn out to be a disaster, or it may be even more fun. Look at all the colors they are. Yeah. Blueberries are easy to grow. They need very little maintenance. The work involved, and it's not really work, is at the planting time and when they start to ripen up. Now, blueberries are unique in our gardens in that they need the most acidic soil of any plant we grow. Blueberries originated, so to speak, in peat bogs or near peat bogs. Soil so acidic, if you had a cut on your finger, it would hurt if you got your finger in the soil. I would recommend, actually half milled peat moss and half compost, and that mm -hmm. should keep them happy. If you notice yellowing of the leaves during their lifespan, that means the soil is no longer as acidic as it should be, and you might have to dust a little sulfur around the okay. plant. Make sure, wait a minute, you planted this thing already. Yeah, I did, and, and ironically, I did use, um, I didn't use a lot of the original soil. I did, and I did um, use, uh, it's like a cow manure compost put together and then, and then um, some, of the, some of the original soil and then the other was just a regular other type of soil. So I kind of just mixed it because the ground I'm digging in is very rocky anyways. Um, you know, it's compacted dirt and, and rock. So I, I dug the hole like three times the size of the of what you're supposed to do. It's just so that I, I would get a, to give it a chance. You know, I didn't want it to be sitting in water. I wanted to make sure it was going to drain properly and all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's in the ground, and I'm, I'm just checking off the box. Except I didn't use the peat moss. I, I did use I did use a compost. So no, um, you didn't. I don't know. You didn't use compost. You used I mean, cow, you used cow manure. Well, it's like a mixture of cow manure and compost. Like they said, it was like a mixture of stuff. Yeah, you could so have ball it... bearings in there. <laughs> oh, my God. You don't use any type of manure near a fruiting plant. Okay. Manure okay. encourages plant growth but inhibits flowering and fruiting. Pull it out of the ground, apologize to it. Make yeah. sure the hole is wide but not deep. You want the okay. plant to be as high as possible. You know, okay. you don't want any soil or mulch or God knows what else you might have in mind 
um, <laughs> touching the bark of this shrub. Okay. You okay. really want it to be high, not low, but a wide hole is good. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, it sounds like I got a lot of work to do. Lose my so number. I got to get cracking. Lose my number, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike, I promise. Take care. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. That was the Cole Porters playing Chopping the Garlic live at the Green Note. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind everybody out there that it is still prime time for fall planting of crops like garlic, greens, and onions in most of the country. So get out there and get growing. I'm your still growing host, Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I'm your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up at the end of the show, 13 things you need or should do. You need to do or should do. Anyway, 13 things for fall that will keep you out of trouble. All right? And now, a very special call for fall. Jake Chalfin from Laurel Valley Soils has been on the show before. His company makes large amounts of compost and other professional soil mixes. And he sent out an email a couple of days ago that reminded me that this is the perfect time of year to, quote, top dress your lawn with compost, not fertilizers. So I got to thank you, Jake, because 
there's so much to do in fall. There's so much to talk about. Um, I kind of let top dressing your lawn slip by me. So thanks for your email. Mike, thanks for having me back on the show. And uh, I, as you know, I love talking about this. It, fall has traditionally been, uh, as, as I know you've preached, but it's, it's traditionally been uh, the time of year that uh, nurserymen uh, love to promote the planting of, of trees and shrubs and, and also cool season turf grasses. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great time of year because if you, uh, you know, plant your, your grass seed or your trees or your shrubs now, they've got a couple of months of really good growing season, uh, and then they get to go dormant. And then when they wake up in the spring, um, they're pushing out roots naturally and immediately, and they have a much better chance of surviving, you know, the harsh, dry, hot summer uh, season. So, so you get a lot better survivability uh, trees, shrubs, or turf when you, when, you, when you do the work in the fall. You had a nifty video. You were trying to explain um, this system to me on the phone, but you had a, a fairly compact a compost tosser, for lack of a better word. Um, it was yep. not that huge. It was the size of what, two wheelbarrows? Yeah, so, you know, over the years, you know, compost, uh, the benefits of top dressing with compost have have uh, been well understood, and uh, it's a popular thing to do. Uh, you know, the challenge has been um, how do you apply it? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, in small residential lawns, uh, it's really not too much of an effort to get a few yards and then you know, a rake and a wheelbarrow and a shovel and just spread it out by hand and rake it. Not not too big a deal. But then if you have folks with slightly larger, more suburban lawns, um, you know, then it becomes a bit more of a, of a, of a large, larger project. And that's when you might want to try to find a piece of equipment that can help uh, do the work for you. So uh, these small kind of scale homeowner size equipment uh, has recently really become more available. And uh, it's really easy for a homeowner to rent this from a, a local, you know, general rental equipment uh, company. Mm-hmm. And, and they can go and do a, a half acre yard uh, by lunchtime. One of the things that people, a lot of people still don't get, is that if you have a cool season lawn, that's fescue, rye, bluegrass, this is the time to do almost everything that your lawn might need. A hundred percent, Mike. And this is why I get really excited about compost, because uh, when, when people are talking about um, lawn treatments, whether it's, you know, managing weeds, managing fertilization, managing uh, thin, poor, compacted soils, uh, you know, a lot of times the conversation's about individual things that you could do during different times of the year. With compost, you're pretty much, you know, able to do a lot of a lot of benefit in in one application, and and we really like to think about it as we're feeding the soil, and then the soil is feeding the grass. And and what does the soil need? The soil is a living being, just like a, a human body or an animal body, and it requires oxygen and water and and nutrition. Uh, and when soils get compacted. Uh, there's less, you know, micro pore space in that soil for the air space for the for it to be able to hold uh, enough moisture for the dry season, for it to allow excess moisture to, to percolate through in the wet season. So, so compost is, it has a high percentage of organic matter in it, um, and that organic matter helps build uh, the soil structure um, in, in in creating a healthy soil profile that. Um, uh, can support biological life, um, and bi- the, the biology in a healthy soil helps fight turf disease um, and help uh, uh, the grass and the roots uh, absorb and um, digest uh, naturally occurring nutrients. If you were to top dress your lawn just once this fall with compost, when you see the difference next spring, you'll never buy an artificial fertilizer again. It's just remarkable. And instead of threatening our waterways and the planet, 
you're you're making your lawn a a great source of oxygen, using up our CO two, um, taking carbon the, sink. Yeah. yeah, turn yeah, you turn your lawn in into carbon retention. To get the full benefit of the compost, we want to get that compost as deep into the soil profile as possible. And now, you know, now that we've had some good rain at the start of the fall season, the ground is more penetrable. So it's a great time to aerate. A lot of, a lot of uh, professional landscapers will do a package where they will aerate your lawn, top dress it with compost, and overseed it all, all in the same day. And, and it's like that trifecta it will really <laughs> get you uh, good performance. And, you know, it's these, these um, more aerated, lighter, better soils with better porosity, you know, they will absorb um, these severe rain events we, we've been having. They'll absorb that better in place, uh, which, which will help uh, reduce kind of the, the surface flooding that we've seen so often. Jake, I got to get rid yeah. of you now. Um, <laughs> people want to hear more. It's Laurel Valley Soils. There is lots of information on the benefits of compost, the different products that we offer uh, that can either be uh, purchased by a professional landscaper uh, that you might want to hire to do your work for you, or we have a list of garden centers uh, that hopefully we have a garden center near you that sells our premium compost, and you can uh, go and get a few yards yourself or have a few yards delivered and, 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 and do the elbow work yourself. Um, so, yeah, check us out at laurelvalleysoils.com. We'd love to help you out. All right. Get out of here, you knucklehead. I'll have you back on again soon. Thanks, Mike. Always fun to chat with you. Take care. Bye-bye. 888-492-9444. Sue, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi. How are you? I am just Ducky. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> Ducky is back from his summer vacation and... We're all oh, happy here in beautiful Bethlehem, PA. How is Sue? Sue is just wonderful, and I used to use that word or that term ducky all the time. Uh-huh. I did. I, bl- I believe you. Many of us are ducky. Many of us are other things. Um, right. And where is Sue? Sue is in Alaska, Wisconsin. Uh, say the first part. On Alaska, Wisconsin. On Alaska, Wisconsin. Yes. So somebody took parts of Alaska and dropped it onto Wisconsin. On Alaska, not Alaska. <laughs> O-N-A, on Alaska. Which probably sounds like a Native American term. Um, <laughs> where, where, in, um, <laughs> where in Alaska are you? <laughs> where in, on Alaska? Uh, we're close, we're, we're close we, to Madison. Okay, good. Good. Where the 60s will live forever. Yes. All right. What can we do you for? I have two um, little plants that I planted this um, spring. They are called a hibiscus bush, and they're the paper plate flower uh, variety. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know how to protect them this winter because... Uh, of course, Wisconsin gets very cold winters, and there one's about a foot and a half right now, mm-hmm. and one's about only maybe a foot. And I was wondering if I could have some help on how to protect them this winter. So um, they did grow them, grow them from just a seed to from a plant into the ground. Okay, great. Um, now, are you certain that they are hardy? And I don't mean unprotected hardy in your region that, for instance, I could leave them in the ground in Pennsylvania and they wouldn't die. Right. Um, I do know that one of my really good friends has the, uh, she has like several in her backyard, but she doesn't remember what she did the first winter to protect them. Okay, good. Well, you got a lot of options. Okay. Um, You say one of them's a foot and a half tall. What about the other one? About, About a foot. About a foot. A are they slower growing? Are they close uh-huh. together, or are they um, no separate? No, they're far apart. They're about um, three feet apart, so I give them room to grow. Okay. Well, the classic answer would be a cloche, um, which can be made. I have um, a very popular style 
um, they're green plastic with a little breathing hole at the top. And they're kind of, I don't know how to, it, you know, uh, they're, they're <laughs> shaped nicely. <laughs> they're, they're wide. They're kind of rectangular. Uh, why do I get myself in this trouble? Uh, I but, don't know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, cloches are the classic way of protecting young plants that are hardy during their first winter. I also have okay. a beautiful glass one that's shaped like an enormous bell. Um, you want to send that to me? Yeah, sure. <laughs> cost cost more to ship than it probably cost somebody to buy. Um, the another way, of course, is um, you could just pile shredded leaves around them. The At only, the bottom of the base there? No, no, the whole plant. Oh, just cover the whole thing? Yeah. The danger there is voles or mice could get in and eat the bark. Oh. So oh. okay. what, what I would suggest is, uh, do you know anything about row covers? Float- no, I've never heard of that. Yeah. Uh, floating row covers. The biggest brand name is Remay, R-E-E-M-A-Y. And this is what people use to grow uh, lettuce all winter long. It's uh, oh. a polyethylene or similar material blanket uh, that you lay across the top of your plants. Or if you get real fancy, um, some of them come with hoops so you can have a row of somewhat tall plants and they're protected oh, okay. by it. You know, it's also great <clears throat> for putting peppers and tomatoes out a little early in the season to protect okay. them. So you can get. Um, a roll of floating row cover from any independent garden center or nursery. And um, do you have a vegetable garden? Yes, we do. It's a stand-up one, and then we have a a small tomato garden over in our backyard there. Okay. Well, I think if you buy a roll of Rime, um, you can grow lettuce I'm not going to say in the dead of winter where you are, uh, but you can extend your lettuce harvesting season by a good month on either end. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, if you get heavy-duty row covers, which, come to think of it, with, with, your, um, with your cold winters up there, I would recommend that. Um, yeah, the plants won't die, but... Um, they won't, okay. They'll look like the dog's breakfast in January and February. <laughs> uh, but a lot of them will come back, or you can sow seeds a little earlier, and the row covers trap heat, so the seeds germinate much faster. You know, I did try to plant seeds in the ground, the same, the same plant, right, yeah. last fall Mm -hmm. and i didn't know you'd had to cover it i just we put them in the ground and just covered it up back with the dirt didn't know good to know though okay good to know did did it work no (laughs) we didn't cover it we didn't cover it like you had, had just said right we didn't know we had to yeah um your other option would be if you had a time machine uh go back and and grow them in pots the first year and then move them into, like, cold storage, like an unheated garage or something. Gotcha. But now... Well, I don't have that luxury, so... Yeah. Uh, I, what, do you, uh, what do you think about putting a bunch of mulch down and putting, like, a styrofoam cone on top of it and leaving the top open? Would that be an option at all? Oh, sure. The plants would die, but it's an option. Oh, but, no, 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 no. Now, mulch, no. mulch does not mean shredded wood. Mulch is a term for anything uh, that inhibits the growth of weeds and keeps moisture in the soil. Are you talking about wood mulch? Wood mulch, yeah. Yeah, no, it's deadly to plants. It's bad for your home. No, no. Okay. You'll do fine. Uh, I would put two to three inches of shredded fall leaves around the base of the plants and then wrap the top with a row cover and you should be fine. Oh, okay. Just do I cover the whole plant then? With yeah, because this, um... it, it's breathable. Okay, perfect. All right. 
All right. Yes. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Good luck to you. Oh, thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Well, it's time for me to take another little break and remind everybody once again that the time to collect and shred fall leaves will soon be here. A mulching mower is great for taking care of the leaves on your lawn, but for the other places on your property, you should use a rechargeable leaf blower with a vacuum setting and collection bag. There's no bending or raking. The machine sucks up the leaves, shreds them for you, and deposits them in the convenient shoulder bag for compost making and easy mulching. I'm reasonably easy, Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. This is 91.3 FM, WLVR Bethlehem, WLVR.org. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in beautiful Bethlehem, PA. I'm your beautiful host, Mike McGrath, and we're in the stretch now, cats and kittens. In just a little bit, we will get to the question of the week which, like the previous weeks, isn't so much a question as marching orders for fall that will help you have a better garden next season. But before that, a couple more of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. Carol, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hi, Carol. What's your dog's name? (laughs) Lorraine. Lorraine. Lorraine, yes. Yeah. That's She's not adorable. that's not a real dog's name. Come on. <laughs> oh, it suits her. <laughs> really? Sweet Lorraine. Yeah. All yeah. right. <laughs> uh, where are you, Carol? I'm in Sudbury, Mass. All yeah, right. What can we do for Carol in Massachusetts? Um, okay, so I'm trying to convert lawn area to wild flower. Um see, you know, mm-hmm. beautiful meadows, and it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. So I started with just a patch, and I um, I had people pull up the lawn, so they actually dug it up. Right, it with took, a sod cutter. Right. Well, they, you know, with tools. <laughs> they weren't professional. I don't know how professional, but anyway, they dug it up, and then I threw seeds, and the wildflowers did come up, but there was tons of grass. So, yeah. And when the grass gets long, it's impossible to pull it out without pulling out the wildflowers. So there's supposed to be, in England, they always talk about this yellow rattle seeds that you put down and you it inhibits emailed, the grasses. You emailed yes. me looking I did. for a source of these seeds. And you were right. very lucky because I was just back from my sabbatical And I have to tell everybody right now, there are months of emails that I never saw that came into the show. So I'm not evading any of you. And if your problem is still evident or important, email me again. But um, I think I, I talked to my producer and asked her to be on the show because you didn't need me for that. All I did was search yellow rattle seeds and i got all I sorts of seed companies um, well no well, actually it's not true because i try i placed four orders yeah and all of the yellow rattle seeds are coming from england 
and there's some sort of a moratorium. They're not allowed to deliver to the U.S. No, there's sanitary laws. Um, you know, even they, it, even with seeds, this is how some diseases and pests can get in. Well, I know, but it seemed to be, um, you know, these were like international seed companies. They seem to deliver other seeds to the U.S., but not yellow rattle. Huh, that's like interesting. Specifically. Now, you know, I'd never heard of the plant. Now that I realize it's uh, British origin, I'm not surprised. When I first read your email, I was tired, and I thought, who cares what kind of seeds you put in a baby's rattle? You know, <laughs> I, th I would suspect that might be the derivation of the name. But why are you hung up on this uh, plant? Well, because they're, they explain on the, you know, Gardener's World and other things that what this yellow rattle does is it, uh, it attaches, it somehow inhibits the grasses growing. Oh, sure. It's allopathic. It, it, yeah. And, and it, but it allows the wildflowers to grow, and that's exactly what I need. Hmm. Well, that so, is, is very interesting. Off the top of my head, um, you know what? Um, I don't know any company uh, that takes any kind of risk in sending stuff uh, overseas. Uh, but did you look for perhaps Canadian seed companies? No, not specifically. I looked at every, you know, I checked out every single seed company and like all the reputable or, you know, big like Johnny's and all the various ones that have just about everything you can think of have nothing. They they give you yellow flowers if you put in yellow rattle. They have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I admit I didn't try to order them. Um, well, but the good, you funny caught thing me. Was I ordered, I'm, I'm sorry, I no, no, ordered go ahead. two. I ordered two, I placed two orders, and they, you know, they, they said, like, the, sh the seeds were $5 and the shipping was 10 because it was coming from the U.K. Right. And it all went through, and then the next day I got an email, we can't ship this particular seed to you. Mm -hmm. So they, they clearly do it other, with other seeds. So I was wondering, um, you know, what was so bad about, is it invasive in some way? Well, so? no, but the fact that it, um, again, I, I don't even think it's the fact that it, it inhibits the growth of other plants or, or they wouldn't sell black walnuts, but, um, it is possible for, it's very possible for potted plants or bare root plants, uh, to harbor diseases or pests, but it can even happen in seeds. So um, there must be a problem with it, or maybe they don't have enough of them and they don't want to give any to us, you know, because we beat them 200 some years ago. I would check, and this is just off the top of my head, you know, the passing of Queen Elizabeth um, a lot of the articles I was reading about her mentioned that the monarchy is still, you know, active, so to speak, in places like Australia and I believe New Zealand and many parts of Africa. So I know there are some real premium seed companies in New Zealand. So that would be your next search, seed companies okay. in New Zealand and maybe they would not have the same prohibition. Okay. okay. But it, it's right. an interesting plant, and I'm going to start researching it. But I didn't look up anything other than the people who lied and said they would send them to you. Right. <laughs> no. well, oh, 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 oh. And if we have any yellow rattle plant growers out there, who might want to help Carol out, give us a call, 888-492-9444, and we'll try to put you in touch. How's that? Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Don't Thank worry. We'll so send much, you a bill Mike. for the airtime. <laughs> okay. All right. Good luck, Thank Carol. Thank you. My Thanks pleasure. Thanks so much, Mike. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes, as Thanos says, it is inevitable. The question 
of the week. And this week, it's not so much a question, but marching orders. Here's a baker's dozen of things you must or should do this fall. All right, let's go. If you haven't got your garlic cloves in the ground, do so now. The earlier in fall you plant, the bigger the bulbs you'll harvest next season. Obtain planting garlic from a reliable online source, or even better, a local farmer's market. Don't use supermarket garlic. It's probably from China, treated with sprouting inhibitors and God knows what else, and is almost certainly the wrong type for your region. Listen to the previous two week shows for insufferable garlic planting details. Ah, but wait to plant spring bulbs. In most of the mid-Atlantic region, spring blooming bulbs should be planted between Halloween and Thanksgiving. Note, deer, rabbits, voles, and evil squirrels will gleefully dine on tulips as the plants and their bulbs are delicious and nutritious. If you are so varmint infested, think about planting daffodils instead. No creature bothers daffodils, plants, or bulbs, and they also naturalize, meaning they spread and prosper over the years. If you live in a region with a markedly different climate than mine, which is not my fault, plant your spring bulbs earlier the further north you are, at least six weeks before your soil freezes hard and plant a little later between Pennsylvania and the Carolinas. If you and your fellow warm winter climate cowards put on parkas as soon as it's less than 60 degrees outside, be sure to purchase pre-chilled bulbs from your local nursery or garden center or a catalog that specifies this odd adaption. If you plan to outdoor decorate for fall, see if you can find some corn stalks instead of the usual dreary pumpkins and hay bales. Harvested corn stalks are very attractive, provide something nifty and seasonal to look at up high, and can serve as the shredded brown material in your compost bin or pile after you shred them, of course. But don't neglect your fall leaves. Although many people still foolishly pay to have theirs hauled away in SPBs, shredded fall leaves are the ultimate brown material in a compost pile, teeming, teeming with billions of nutrients and biological life forms. Plus, they are one of the few materials that you can compost on their own and end up with beautiful black gold although adding spent coffee grounds, coffee grounds to the mix, makes the compost faster and better without attracting any vermin. Speaking of vermin, do not add vegetable waste to an open compost pile. It offers little in the way of nutrition and attracts mice, rats, voles, raccoons, groundhogs, and other creatures you do not want to attract. Get a worm bin for your kitchen garbage instead. The red wigglers, which live inside your bin, will turn that otherwise useless garbage into fabulous plant-feeding worm castings. Remember, the holidays are coming. Worm bins make a great gift. Yes, the leaves that make up the vast bulk of your raw ingredients must be shredded or they'll just mat down and take years to produce decent compost. You can shred them excellently with a bagging lawnmower, unless you have foolishly treated your lawn with herbicides and or weed and feed. If you do such a foolish thing, the resulting compost will kill many, if not all, of the plants in your summer garden. But, if your lawn is untreated, be sure to do the opposite and collect the leaves on your lawn with the mower set at its highest setting. The resulting mix of dry brown shredded leaves and a little bit of nitrogen-rich grass clippings makes perfect compost and makes it fast. 
Yes, that also means you should not compost grass clippings from a treated lawn. Instead, mulch those compromised clippings back into the lawn to feed the grass naturally and not kill anything. Whatever you do with them, do not burn your leaves. Burning eliminates their fertilizing and composting potential, pollutes the air, and makes the polar ice caps melt even faster. Give your unwanted leaves to a gardening friend. Shred them into your lawn with a mulching mower or put them out for collection and subsequent composting. Visit your local government's website for collection details and timing. Speaking once again of vermin, this is the time of year when miserable Mises, who previously lived outdoors feeding ticks all summer long, look lovingly to the nice warm premises of your pantries. Old-fashioned snap traps baited with peanut butter are very effective at sending Mickey and his pals to their eternal reward or elsewhere. Wear gloves when handling the traps and disposing of the enemy. And remember, kids, the real world is Darwin, not Disney. If you grew peppers this year, and if not, why not? Consider bringing your best plants inside for the winter. Peppers, both hot and sweet, are perennials that can live many years if protected from temperatures below 50 degrees. Yes, I said 50 degrees. Forget about actual frost. These tropical plants have no sense of humor about trying to survive the 40s. If the plants are not in pots, pot them up now. Don't wait until the last minute. Rinse each plant well with sharp streams of water to eradicate the aphids that are there but you can't see and leave the plants outside for a few days in their pots. Then rinse them again with even sharper streams of water and wipe the pots down with a wet washcloth and check the bottom for hitchhiking slugs or snails. Peppers overwintered indoors. It's all about the light, cats and kittens. Positioned directly under a four-tube shop light fitted with four-foot-long bulbs is ideal. Keep the tops of the plants as close to the tubes as possible, and they'll reward you by flowering and fruiting all winter long. Mm, maybe. Well, that sure was some helpful information that should keep you out of trouble for the next month or two now, wasn't it? Luckily for you, the question of the week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website. To read it over at your leisure or your leisure, just click the link for the question of the week at our website, which is still and will forever be youbetyourgarden.org. Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden Question of the Week, and you will always find the latest question of the week at the Gardens Alive website. You Bet Your Garden is a half-hour public television show, an hour-long public radio show and podcast, all produced and delivered to you weekly from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when he saw his first episodes of The Lone Ranger and The Adventures of Superman on the same Saturday morning. Yikes, my producer is threatening to poach my peppers if I don't get out of this studio. We must be out of time. But you can call us anytime at 888-492-9444 or send us your email, your tired, your poor, your wretched refuse teeming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt.org. Please always include your location. And no, if you emailed me three years ago, I probably don't remember where you live. I'm your hot mess, Mike McGrath. And I'll be begging my tomato plants to die so I can get out of the kitchen and see you again next week.
You've been listening to an encore presentation of You Bet Your Garden. <laughs>